Thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation to present our work on RNA modification detection. We have a very uh, large overview. This year shows our genome and the genes are transcribed to generate the RNA. And we are working uh, on computational methods to analyze transcriptomic data, the set of all of these RNAs in our cell. And the reason why we're interested in it is because there's such a complexity because of alternative splicing, start and end sites, that each gene can actually generate a lot of different versions of those RNAs. And so there's also a poster, if you want to see that from my team, poster number one, talking a bit more about those aspects. But today I want to talk about one additional thing, that is even if the RNA sequence is the same, it can still be functionally different. And that's because of RNA modifications. These RNA modifications, they are chemical alterations of these nucleotides. And uh, they are written by um, writer enzymes, and they can be removed by eraser enzymes. And then they are interpreted through reader enzymes. And that way, these RNA modifications can actually impact how the RNA is itself is interpreted and the function of this RNA. This shows an overview of the RNA modifications that we know at mRNA molecules. You can see there's actually a large number of different RNA modifications. I will be talking mostly about M6A, which is uh, the most frequent mRNA modification. Um, there's a lot of ways in which M6A can impact the function of RNAs, for example, through the RNA stability or the ability to translate into proteins. There's also been involved in embryonic development and in human diseases. Um, for example, metal 3, the writer of M6A, uh, is currently uh, tested as there's a small molecule that can inhibit it in leukemia. Okay, so how do we profile M6A transcriptome-wide? In principle, what we could do is, and that's how these um, cDNA sequencing-based methods work, we identify the position of M6A at individual RNAs, and then one extracts those sequences and uses a sequencing approach to align it back to the genome. And from that approach, what we get is the following. We can identify the position of each gene where these M6A modifications can occur. Okay. So using these methods, we can identify the site, what we call the site level modification probability. So we can really find out which gene can generate modified RNAs. But what we want to know is really the picture on the right. We want to know which RNAs are modified. Okay. And if we are able to do that, we can answer more questions. For example, how many of these RNAs are actually modified? Do they co-occur? And are they associated, for example, with RNA processing? So the technology that we're using is nanopore sequencing, and so that does not need much of an introduction. The principle is, um, of course, very familiar to all of you. The nucleic acid is directly put to the pore, and then an electric current signal is measured. And from that signal, we can identify the sequence that goes to the pore. And it looks something like that. Now, the advantage here is that we can sequence RNA directly, and that means we can sequence the RNA with modifications being present. And that results in a change for example, if you look into this position A, if there is a modified A, such an M6A, there will be a shift in the signal. And this is what we can use to identify modifications with direct RNA sequencing data. And we can do that using supervised machine learning methods. Now, it's not as easy as here, where you have you know, the blue read and the red read. One is modified, one is unmodified. It's a bit more tricky, and that is because the data looks more like that. We don't know which read is modified and which read is unmodified. But what we know is that at this position, this gene can generate modified RNAs. We just don't know which ones of those are modified. And so in the end, we are back to the same problem that I've mentioned before. Now we have data for individual reads, but uh, we're still somehow limited to these site level labels. We only know at this gene, there's a certain modification. But we don't know which of these reads, which of these RNAs. And so that problem is actually known in the machine learning literature as a multiple instance learning problem. Okay. Just a very brief introduction. You can think about it in these terms as well. Imagine there's three security guards, and each of them have a keychain. And two of those security guards can open a certain door to a building. The reason they can open the door is that they have the right key, but we only know that the security guard can open the door. We don't know which key. And so in that case, the keychain here, that's what we call the bag, and the keys are the instances. And that's very similar to what we are working with with RNA data. The bag is the set of all RNAs that are generated for a certain gene. And we know that at this position, there can be um, some RNAs that are modified, but we do not know which of these RNAs are modified. And so what we did is we implemented a method that's called M6A net that uses this multiple instance learning framework to identify M6A modifications. So very briefly, this works by using the signal data and the sequence data, which is first mapped into a higher dimensional space. 
And then that space is used um, to represent um, each read in um, 20 dimensions. And then the second la layer is an um, encoder that maps those dimensions back to an individual read level modification probability. The final step is that then that we calculate a site level probability. So the beautiful thing here is that we actually can learn all of that end to end. The only thing that we need to know is the site level probability. Okay? That's the information that we have. But implicitly, we can learn a representation for each read and a probability for each read that it is modified. To illustrate how that looks, just for one gene example here, this is the data that we use for training. Okay, so this the known positions that are modified. And then here in blue, you can see the predictions that we make, which are very similar. So that means you know, very close to what we want to see. Of course, at the same time, you also get the expression data from direct RNA sequencing, which is very nice. And another advantage is that this is an assay that's very simple to perform, which means we can look into a lot of samples at the same time. Now here, this is just one example, and we have the training data. We make the pred predictions. It looks very similar. That's not too meaningful. What we want to know is we want to know whether we can actually make predictions for data that we haven't used for training. And we usually evaluate that using cross-validation, which means we train on one part of the data, we apply on another part of the data. And then we evaluate that using uh, typically a rock curve. That's what you can see here. The higher the curve, the better. And what you can see is that M6A net actually shows a very good performance when compared to all other tools. And for completeness, we tested this on different numbers of uh, M6A motifs, just because some tools don't, are not able to test for all. But the picture looks very similar. There's another way to evaluate classifiers if there's imbalanced data, such as M6A. We have a lot of unmodified positions and very few modified positions. And so we usually evaluate classifiers in, for such a scenario using a precision recall curve. Okay. You can see how it looks. The main point, again, is M6A net actually uh, has a very good performance compared to all other tools. I can talk a lot about these figures and why the precision looks low. It's not related to the classifier accuracy. It's more related to how we evaluate it. Okay? If anyone is interested in these details, talk to me. I'm really happy to talk more about it. So what we did is we trained on one human cell line, and then we tested it on another cell line. And we thought, well, that's very good. You know, if you train on a kidney cell line and you make predictions in colon cancer cell lines, that means your method actually can generalize very well. That's what we want to see. But then um, we had a lot of credits to very good reviewers that we had. And they suggested that you should look into a different context where the KMAs are very different, such as Arabidopsis. And Arabidopsis has a very different M6A profile. So the question is, can we learn our model on Arabidopsis and still identify M6A in a human sample. And that's the result. And again, it looks very similar. There's a small difference, but we actually also know where it comes from. And in any case, the model that we learn on Arab Arabidopsis works better on the human cell line than any of the other methods. So we, we really think it works very well. Um, if I have not convinced you yet, there's also other people who have looked into it. And so this is a few months ago. There was a benchmark of all existing methods to detect M6A from direct RNA sequencing data. And the picture looks very similar with M6A net just showing a very good performance. OK, so one thing I want to talk briefly about is the ability to look into single molecules. And the way this, that is done is through this architecture that implicitly identifies or maps um, each read to a certain probability of this read being modified. So we can use that to visualize those reads in two dimensions. And what you can see here is data from a wild type cell line, where you have modified and unmodified reads, and a cell line that has a knockout of the metal 3 M6A writer, where you expect unmodified reads. And you can see you can separate the data already. Now, this is just a vis visualization. So we wanted to quantify it. How well can we do that? And the first thing we did is look into synthetic data with 100% M6A modifications and unmodified reads. And we combined that at different ratios and then asked, how well can we identify the fraction of modified reads using this approach? And what you can see here is that this actually seems to work pretty well. Now, we use this for calibration, so that's as good as it gets. But we also asked, how well does it work on human RNA, which we mix at certain ratios, so we know the expected um, modification ratio. And that's how it looks. Again, what we see is very close to what we expect, meaning that the single molecule predictions seem to be relatively close to what we would see um, in terms of number of modified RNAs. OK, so this is a summary of M6A net. It accurately identifies M6A from direct RNA sequencing data. It has a very good performance, also compared against other methods. And we can identify M6A um, for single molecules, and it seems to reflect the overall expected modification rates. 
um, M6N generalizes very well to new cell lines and also to new species, which means you can use the model as it is to apply it on a direct RNA sequencing data. You don't need to do any training or anything else. No control data set, nothing. You can really apply it on just a single run of direct RNA sequencing data. So there's no retraining, nothing additional required. One question, what about changes in the nanopore sequencing chemistry? It's a supervised model, so that's optimized for whatever data we use for learning. Okay? You can apply it on another species, but you cannot apply it on the same species if the chemistry changes. So how does that look? Okay, so we tested the RNA004, so a lot of uh, thanks to everyone from nanopore. That was really nice that we could test that very early on. Uh, the first thing you see, there's a lot of additional data that we get from these flow cells on the new chemistry kit but the signal data does look different, okay? You cannot use our method anymore to identify M6A. And it's not just our method. Essentially, once this kit is released, none of the existing methods uh, will work anymore, okay? So we tried to change that, at least for M6A net, and uh, there were a few other steps involved. One is the data processing, so we got really great help from uh, Hasintu and, and Australia, who enabled that we can process that to F5C. That's the first step. And that's used then as input for M6A net, which we then could retrain. Um, and so many thanks here to Yuki and Chris who did that. And the data looks like this. Uh, we actually can see that compared to RNA002, the performance on 004 is very good. It might even look slightly better, even though that's a bit difficult to say at this point. But one thing that we see definitely is that you get much more data. The accuracy seems to be very good. So you can use M6A net now also for RNA004 for anyone who's in the early access program. And then read just the last slide, if you have not worked with direct RNA sequencing data or long read RNA sequencing data in general, there's this um, data set that we made publicly available. That's the SGNX project. It contains a large amount of RNA sequencing data, the cDNA sequencing, but also direct RNA sequencing and some other data sets. And also includes a lot of tutorials and other information online. It's all available to AWS, which means if you work with direct RNA sequencing data, you can download all these raw data sets directly to the cloud, which is just much faster than going to any of the official repositories. Yeah. So this should be really, really helpful if you're interested in exploring that. You can look at the tutorials as well to see how to perform analysis in terms of transcript, discovery, quantification, or RNA modifications. All right, with that, I'd like to thank everyone involved. That is, for M6Anet in particular, Christopher Hendra, a PhD student in my team, and also UK1, and Chen Ying, who has done the, a lot of the work on the SNX project. And with that, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>